Awesome. Do you guys like that game with the with the holding up stuff? No. No? No? I think Mr. Miano was definitely the best one up there, right? Was Mr. Yes. yes. Oh, just me. Sorry. And Mr. Miano. Um, anyway, uh, Genesis 22 today. Genesis 22. If you have your Bibles, if you have your phones, Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to turn there with you. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. How many of you guys played on inflatables when you were younger? Inflatables, you know, like the big blow up things, the things that like, you know, you have it bounce, bounce houses, you got the different, you know, water slides, you got the different, all that whatnot. Inflatables. And, and I used to love inflatables until I went to uh, a church um, in Texas in Garland. And, and this church uh, was a little inflatable crazy, if I were to say it that way. They owned, not, not just rented, they owned 50 inflatables by themselves. And these are not just any inflatables, let me, hear, let me tell you. These are like hundreds of tons of inflatables, massive things. There's one that's bigger than me. So it took four guys to roll it. Not pick it up, but to roll it. So these are massive, massive inflatables. And, and they were a little bit inflatable crazy. And so there was a night where they decided, hey, we're going to have a carnival night. We're going to have all of these inflatables out for, for kids everywhere. So there's, there's like 10, 15, 20 inflatables out. And we're putting them all out, and we're, and we're getting them all set. So we have this um, carnival night, one night, of this VBS. Then the next night, we have like a, a mini carnival night where we have some of the bigger inflatables still out there. And one of the, there's a couple inflatables I want to tell you about. There's one of them that was an Indiana Jones inflatable. Isn't that cool? An Indiana Jones inflatable, okay? So it's got this massive elephant, like huge elephant, then a giraffe, and then um, just, you know, you run through the cave and there's like the big holder thing, that is like the big boulder, all of it's there. So they got this big Indiana Jones inflatable that's on like the way far side of the field. I am putting up a, a pyramid inflatable. So it's like this massive pyramid, but what it actually is it's a zip line, all right? So like, so like the, you blew this massive inflatable up and it becomes a zip line where you can zip line down from the big top of the pyramid to the bottom, okay? So those are the two inflatables. And one night, we take down the inflatables at night because it's in Texas and it's hot. So I'm on the pyramid one and somebody else is over there on the Indiana Jones one, way over there. There's many, many more. But this night, it was particularly windy, like super, super windy, all right? And I'm putting up this, this, uh, this pyramid inflatable, okay? I'm putting it up and blowing it up and putting the, the blower things in there and just, just blowing it up. And then as we were blowing it up, the wind started to gust more. Like, boof, boof. The wind would gust. And I'm like, this is not good. Like, I got it, like, uh, caught in the ground. But, you know, this is my, tri like, my pyramid one. The Indiana Jones one is two pieces where they have the big elephant and then they have the actual thing. So I'm like, I don't know about this. And I'm like, hey man, um, I'm, I asked the other intern guy that was with me, hey man, could you, could you come help me? He's like, oh man, I promise I'm gonna come help you over there. I'm gonna, I'm, I promise I'll be there, I'll be there. And he runs over and helps with the other one. So then, then the wind blew so hard it disconnected the, uh, the um, thing that shoots the air up into it. And so I'm underneath it and, and as I'm watching, this thing is like 50 feet tall. And I'm watching this thing, and I just watch the pyramid like tilt down. And I'm like watching, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and, and, and it comes down on me, and I look over at the guy, and he's over at the Indiana Jones one, and I'm like, this guy promised me that he would come help me with this. And then it just, it falls, and then it falls on top of me. I'm like, oh no, and I jump out, and I push the thing off, and I run, and I look at the guy, and I'm like, why didn't you, and, and as soon as I look to say, like, why didn't you, you know, help me, all I see is the big elephant rolling across <laughs> the entire field, like massive, like 50-foot elephant, <laughs> flying across the field into the bleachers with 30 different guys chasing the elephant, running after it, like, oh, we're going to catch the elephant, this massive elephant. And all I see is, like, well, he couldn't keep his promise to me because he was chasing a massive 50-foot elephant, right? <laughs> That's what... That's what it was. But have you ever had someone tell you, you know, I promised to do something 
but then they don't do it, or they don't follow through, right? Have you ever had someone have, have someone do that to you, where I promise that I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you with this massive inflatable, but then they, don't, they didn't follow through with that inflatable. Well, today, we're gonna be talking about becoming trusters of God's word. So we've, we've been doing this series called Living by the Book, and we've, we've talked about being responders and being doers, and today we're finishing up the series, the final one, with being trusters. And I did look up the word trusters to make sure it was a real word, and it is a real word. Siri, Siri proclaimed that it was a real word. So it is. Trusters is a real word. But we can become trusters of God's word. God promises things in his word. Unlike that guy that was not going to come help me with the inflatable, God always keeps his word, and we can trust in it. And today, we're going to see probably the greatest example of someone trusting in God's word so much that he would go to the very limits of his humanity to trust God's word. And today, I, I want to challenge you. We must become trusters. We must become trusters of God's word. Whatever it says, I trust it. That's what we must become today. As we live by the book, that is what we're going to be talking about today. So let's pray and we'll get right into it. Father, we love you, and I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for this time, and I thank you for uh, letting us be here tonight uh, as a youth group and just having a good time and, and uh, getting prizes and just um, having a great time of fellowship together. But I pray right now we focus in and that we hear from your word and that I hear from you, Father, and that you speak through me and help these teens to take what they hear and to do it, Father. I thank you so much for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. And Genesis 22 is about one man named Abraham. And a little backstory to the story. So we're going to tell the story today, and then we're going to hit the application is how we're going to go by this. Abraham was chosen by God in Genesis 12 to be called out of a people from the land of Ur. Can you guys say Ur with me? Ur. Ur. That's the city name is Ur. I love the city Ur because it's named Ur. That's the only reason why I like the city. So he left Ur, and he went to Israel, Canaan, he didn't know where he was going. Uh, he didn't know what he was doing, but he was just following Jesus. So back then, God called him out of there, went to, to Canaan, and now he's the chosen one of God. And God makes covenants with Abraham uh, throughout Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 22 or so. He makes a few covenants, um, most specifically the Abrahamic covenant, which talks about, I will bless your house, I will bless your offspring, so that your offspring will be plenteous and multiply, and it will fill the earth. And, and, and so that is Abraham as he, as he goes through this. And, and so he gets to Genesis 15 or so. God promised him that he would, he would be f fruitful and multiply and all that in Genesis 12. Genesis 15, they zero in and give a more very specific covenant. And there's the true Abrahamic covenant that, that um, your offspring will be blessed and the people that bless you will be blessed and the people that curse you will be cursed because he's God's people. So God's calling Abraham out of, the, uh, out of the world to become God's people. And so Abraham has a long life of slip ups. He does dumb things, then he does dumb things, but then he does good things and then he does and he, and he follows Christ, and he follows Christ. In Genesis 22, he comes to a place where he's been following Christ, and he's been following God and what he's saying. And Genesis 22 comes to a point where God decides it's time to test Abraham. So I gave him these covenants, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and, and I told him he would have a son when he was 90 years old, to, and he would have this son. And now that he has this son, he loves this son so much, named Isaac, loved him so much, now... He's going to, um, now he's going to test Abraham because he loves Isaac so much, but God wants to know if he loves God more than Isaac. And so God's going to test him. And the word we're going to see in verse number one um, is tempt. That word means test. God tests him. And, and that word is going to see, God is going to test him because he wants to know if he loves God more than he loves, than he loves his son. So look down with me, Genesis 22, verse number 1. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt, he tested, Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into a land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. 
So I want, to get, I want you to get the gist of the story. God is telling Abraham, I want you to kill your son. I want you to offer him as a burnt sacrifice to me. And the, and the, the Mosaic Covenant has not, been, has not been written yet. So God has not given a written law to them yet. So this is not like against the law or anything like that. But God asked him to kill his son. Imagine that. Like, just think about that with me. Like, isn't that, like, mind-boggling? Like, we read it in the Bible, and it's like, oh, that's, that's a cool story. But really, God asks him to kill his son for him. That's what he's asking him to do. Isn't that crazy? That's mind-boggling. But God has a purpose and a reason for doing this as he does in all scripture, as he does in all of our lives. He has a purpose and a reason for doing this. So I want you guys to continue the story with me. Verse number three, it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took, his, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I, will, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac, he spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Hear my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. God will provide. So Abraham fully knows right now when Isaac asks him that question, he fully knows that God wants him to sacrifice Isaac. But Abraham trusts God. Abraham trusts God's word, what he told him before. We're going to look at that in a minute. Abraham trusts God, what he said before, and he, and he knows God will provide. God will provide a lamb. Whether that's Isaac or something else, God will provide. <clears throat> so they keep reading with me at the story. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham, he stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son for me. So Abraham comes up here, and he's about to kill him. He has a knife. He has a knife in hand. He's laid on the altar. He's bound on there. Isaac willingly gone on the altar. And then he's going to kill him. He's going to do it. And his arm goes up, and then the angel calls and says, Abraham, stop. God has seen your faith. God has seen how much you love him. You don't have to kill him. Don't kill him. Don't put a hand on the lad, is the King James what it says. Don't put a hand on him because you've proven that you, you love God. And he was going to do it. But the, but the angel says, stop. God says, stop. Don't do it. And then God again, he reiterates his promise again at the end of the chapter because God, because Abraham showed so much trust in what God had said. He showed so much trust in what God had said that he was willing to kill his own son and he was going to do it. But God said, no, don't do it. I see that you trust me. And it's the same way with our lives. God has told us to do certain things. It's crazy things, hard things, whatever it might be. And we should just be willing to do it, to go through it. And today we're talking about becoming trusters. And, and we're going to be talking about um, um, in which areas Abraham shows that. But are you a truster? Do you trust God's word? Abraham trusted God's word. He was so willing to kill his son because he knew God would do something. And that thing, that thing that he was willing and knowing that God was going to do Hebrews tells us in Hebrews eleven nineteen 19, that he knew God was going to raise him from the dead. He knew God was going to raise him from the dead because of what God said. 
And I want, you to, I want to read a verse with you. I want to read a verse with you um, in verse number uh, Genesis 21, 12. And it says, And God said to Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath, hath said to thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God said that it would be Isaac. The chapter before, God told him to kill him. So God said, here it is. Isaac will be the one to continue the seed. Isaac will be the one to continue your offspring, to make you multiply, to, to continue the line. That is who's going to do it. So Isaac is the next chapter. God says, I want you to kill him. In Hebrews 19, 11, 19, it says that he knew so much and he trusted God's word so much that he was going to raise him from the dead. That's how much he trusted God. He told him it was going to be a seed. God's going to keep his word. So Abraham said, you tell me I'm going to kill him. You're going to have to raise him from the dead because you promised me this. That is how hard we can stand on the word of God. That is how hard you can say, God, I trust what this says because you're going to follow through with it. You always follow through with your promises. Abraham trusted it so much. And today we're going to be coming trusters. And we're going to see that in three different ways. And the first thing I want you to see, trusting God's promises, is we need to trust in God's promises. We need to trust in God's promises. The Bible is full of promises. <coughs> the Bible is full of things that God has told you. This is the way it is. This is the way that I am. This is the way it's going to be. He's told us all of those things. We can trust those things. We can trust in God's promises. And the, the picture we see from Abraham in this text is exactly what I just showed you. In Genesis 12, your, your seed's going to multiply through your house. Genesis 15, your seed's going to multiply. Your offspring's, your offspring's going to grow, and I'm going to bless all nations through you, saying that Jesus is going to come. I'm going to bless all these nations through you. And again, Genesis 21, Isaac's going to be the one that this blessed seed is going to come from. But Genesis 22, I want, you to, I want you to sacrifice him to me. Abraham knew and trusted in God's promises. And you can do the exact same. The exact same. You can trust it. What God says, it will happen. If God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, he means it. He says, you can be saved because God always keeps his promises. When, when, when he says, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life, he means it. We can trust it the same way Abraham trusted it. When it says God is the God of all comfort, we can trust that that's who God is. When it says all of these different things, the Lord is our shepherd we shall not want, we can trust that. Because God said it. It's the same thing. Same thing. We are in the same situation that Abraham is in. Not by circumstances, but by the, by the given word of God. That we can trust. That we can trust. I think about this, um, this trusting God's promises. <clears throat> and I think, I always think straight to the gospel. Um, Jesus, the, the whole Old Testament promises it. The whole Old Testament says, hey, God's coming again. Jesus is coming. There's going to be a virgin born, and he's going to, and he's going to lay the iniquity of us all on himself. And he's going to, he's going to uh, save the world from their sins. He's going to do all of these things. And the, and the uh, Israelites, they misconceived that promise and thought it was going to be someone to take over the world and someone that, that, will, that will rule and reign, which he will rule and reign. But they missed the section that says that he's going to die. They missed it, but it says it in Isaiah. And God promised it and promised it and promised it and promised it. And then Jesus came, historically proven, all of it proven. Jesus came, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and now he's sitting on the right hand of God, and then soon he will come again and reign. But when I think of God's promises, I think of that gospel, and that's the greatest promise that God has ever given. And not even do we just have to, to hear that and it goes right over our heads. No, we 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can call upon that. We can call upon Jesus to ask him to save us. We, can, we, we believe that he rose from the dead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We believe that he rose from the dead and we can be saved. And we can live for Christ because of God's promise. Are you trusting in God's promises? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? God has promised that he loves the whole world um, and he would that all men to be saved. And when he says that, we can trust that. He would that every single one of you to be saved. He wants you to be saved and you and you and you and all of you. He wants you to be saved, says that in Peter. He would that all men to be saved. Have you trusted in that? Have you trusted in God's promise? Have you uh, repented of your sins and called upon Jesus to save you? Have you done that today? And if you haven't, I would encourage you, God loves you so much. And he died on the cross. He rose again. You can believe that, just like I talked about. Trusting God's promises. For the saved person, not just do, can we trust in the gospel, there's so many promises that God gives us more than that to trust in. God says that... Uh, uh, um, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, all, un all that I understand, it passes all of it. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you're going through anxiety, when you're going through the hardships, when you're going through the addictions, when you're going through the hard things, God has promised a way out. God has promised peace. Peace in anxiety, peace in, in fear, peace in, in social scaredness, peace in all of it. God has promised it, and we can trust it, and we can do it, and we can respond to it. We can do all of these things because God promised it. That's what we can do. God has given us promises. And just like Abraham who said, I'm going to kill my son because I know you're going to raise him from the dead in Hebrews. I know you're going to raise him from the dead. I'm going to kill him. You can trust in God just as much. God, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on. This is hard, God. I, I don't know what to do, but I'm trusting in you. And I'm trusting what you say. And I pray, I pray that you give me strength. And you can pray that today. You can, you can pray, God, you can give me strength. God, you can... You can um, you are the God who loves me. And you have promised so many exceeding and precious promises that Second Peter talks about. Exceeding and precious promises that we can cling and hold to because God loves us so much to give us the word. So we see first we must trust. To become trusters, we must trust in God's promises, which is ultimately the entire word of God. We must trust in God's promises. The second thing, the second thing we must trust is we must trust in God's direction. We must trust in God's direction. <coughs> when, when Abraham was at the beginning of the story, when Abraham was going to go to a mountain to sacrifice um, Isaac, I want you to notice something very specific. I want you to notice something very specific that this text says that I didn't know till college, till a uh, professor was preaching in chapel. I didn't know this, and it really impacted me, and I want you to know this. And it says in verse, um, in verse, uh, I'm in Genesis 21. Um, it says in verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee out into, uh, into a land of Moriah, and offer him there for burnt offering. And this is the, this is the part I want you to hear. Upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. God did not tell him which mountain to go to. He said, just start going, and then I'm going to tell you what it is. So you can start walking, but I'm going to tell you later. And, and what, that, what that is, is Abraham trusting God's direction for where he was going. There was, uh, there was like seven mountains out there in that mountain pass. There were seven mountains and, and so Abraham was walking towards the mountain range, basically. And God said, I want you to walk toward the mountain range, and I'm going to tell you which one later. I'm going to tell you which one later. But I want you, I want you to, to be willing to sacrifice first before I tell you the direction, which is incredible. And I want you guys to get this. God 
has a direction for your life through his word. God will direct. Um, Psalm 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto thy path. When God told Abraham, I'm going to tell you where you're going to go when you get there. I'll tell thee whichever mountain it is in the future. God directs us in the same way today through his word. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. The lamps there in ancient, in, um, in ancient times were uh, actually uh, like little like oil lamps, right? So the oil lamp, they would put it on the floor and they can only see the next step. They can only see the next step. So they would put it on the floor and they would see the next step. And so when it says thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a line unto thy path, they literally would take one step after another and then they would look with the lamp. It's the same way with your life. God will direct through his word. Thy word is a lamp unto your feet and a line unto your path. The next step, the next step, God will direct you, but we must trust him. We must trust his word and God will direct. We must be surrendered and God will direct. We must. When I heard this sermon uh, about Genesis 22 in the spring, it was this spring, um, and, and, the, uh, and the preacher, he said, um, he said this, this specific point. And I, I'm sitting there, and I, I had a plan. I was going to do something completely different than where I am here. I was going to do something completely different. Um, I'd chosen to do, uh, to do college elsewhere and stay, um, stay there and, just, and basically just float kind of thing. That's what I was choosing to do. And, and when, he, when he said, Abraham took a step. Abraham took many steps of faith in his life. He, he stepped out of Ur, remember? And then he steps toward a mountain. He doesn't know which one it is. And he took many of these steps, these steps of faith. He doesn't know where God is taking him. And I felt like, and I, I believe that God was kicking me in the face per se. He's kicking me, saying, Trevor, you're just sitting here. You're not doing anything. You're not taking that step and not knowing where it's going. You're not kicking me. Uh, you're not going anywhere. You're just kicking me. And, and I'm just sitting. And, and, and when I saw this text that Abraham just decided to go because he loved God and he knew God would keep his promises and God would provide, ultimately, I decided to, to come here and changed all my plans. And here I am and God has changed a lot of things in the last six, seven, eight months now. And God has changed so many things because I took a step because God wanted to take me somewhere that I didn't know where I was going. That, that lamp, that word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. God will direct you where he wants you to go. If you're like, God, I don't know where I'm supposed to go to college. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm sitting here in 11th grade and everybody's finally deciding where, where I'm going, where they're going. I don't know where I'm going. God will direct your path through his word. We just have to trust him. And sometimes that takes a step of faith in not knowing what it is. Sometimes it takes a step and say, God, I'm surrendering. Whatever it is that's holding me back, I surrender, and I'm going to take this step. Sometimes it takes that. Sometimes it's just that step. That word is a lamp unto your feet, a line to your path. Maybe, maybe you're seventh and eighth grade, and it's like, God, I don't, like, I'm just the smallest person in here. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I want to be all in, but it, I might look weird. I might do something crazy. Just take that step. A 10th grader, a 11th grader, uh, a senior in high school, going into college, doing all your, all your stuff, that's going to be awesome. But remember, God's word directs. And take those steps of faith where God wants you to. Take those steps of faith. Trust in God's word. Trust the direction that God has given you. And trust is always in action. Trust is always in action. In James talks about uh, faith without works is dead. We always, get that, we always get that passage mixed up. But that text is talking about when I have faith, when I trust something, it takes an action to prove it. If I, trust it, if I say I trust in something, I trust in a chair, right? Matthew right here is sitting in a chair, right? You're sitting in a chair? No. He's not sitting in a chair. No, Matthew's sitting in a chair right here. Matthew's sitting in the chair right now. He is trusting that chair to hold him up. Are you trusting the chair to hold you up? No. Do you think the chair is going to drop? Yes. He actually thinks the chair is going to drop. Yes. Do you really? 
He is afraid for his life right now. But Matthew right now is actually trusting this chair to hold him up. Because all of you are putting your trust in that chair. And by showing the action of sitting in it, you have trust in the chair. So trust, faith, always leads to action. Always, always, always leads to action. Always. So remember, always leads to action. Faith leads to action. So we must trust in God's promises. We must trust in God's direction. Take that step. And finally, and finally, we must trust in God's provision. We must trust in God's provision. I want to define provision for you really quickly. Provision is, um, by Siri again, the act of providing or supplying. The act of providing or supplying. So God provides for me. God supplies for me. That's the act, the provision. And so in this text, Genesis 22, Abraham takes that step, goes to the mountain, and he's going to, he's going to kill Isaac. He's literally going to kill him with a knife, all of it. Going to kill him. He's going to do it. But the angel stops him. And not just stops him. In verse number 13 it says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen that Jehovah Jireh in, in Hebrew means that God provides. God provides. God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is the God of provision. So we're trusting in God's promises. We're trusting in God's direction and where we're going. God will provide anything that you need. God will provide anything that you need to do his will. God will provide. He'll, he'll take you on those steps. He'll carry you along those steps. That's what he'll do. God will provide. God will provide. I think of the story. I think of the story Peter. Remember Peter? when he was on the boat and the wind and waves are crashing and they see Jesus on the water, walking on the water, and they say, look, it's a ghost. Can you believe that they called him a ghost? Like, a ghost. A ghost. Uh, a ghost. And, and they look and they say, look, it's a ghost. A ghost. And then they're like, oh, no, it's not. It's Jesus. Look at that. It's Jesus. And, and, uh, and, and Peter says, like, if you are Jesus, let me step out on the water. And, and we, we, always, we always get on Peter for, um, you know, sinking later on. We always get on Peter for sinking because, you know, he didn't keep his eyes on Jesus. And that's, like, the most easily preached sermon ever, you know, because you got to keep your eyes on Jesus, right? Easily preached sermon. But, but what, I, what I see is I see Peter stepping out of a boat in the middle of a storm to walk on water, all right? Would you step out on a out of a boat? Like you're driving, you're driving on in Lake Mead. Don't do that. It's nasty out there. And you're you're riding a boat in Lake Mead, and and the winds and the waves start crashing um, because there's a storm once every five years, and there's a storm, and, and, and then the um, and then you decide, hey, I see a guy out there. I'm going to step out and walk on the water. Would you do that? No, you wouldn't do that because you're not going to walk on the water because it's, it's, you know, uh, scientifically impossible to walk on the water, right? Right? Scientifically impossible. But, but, that's what Peter did. Peter saw Jesus, and I trust Jesus so much. He's walking on water, he can make me walk on water. And he steps out in the boat, and he steps, and there he is walking on water. And he took that step, and God provided. And Jesus supplied the need that he had to walk on the water. And he walked on the water. And then, yes, his, he saw the wind and the waves crash. And then he took his eyes off Jesus, and he started sinking because he wasn't thinking about Jesus. He was thinking about his surroundings. But he took that step. 
in the provision God supplied him with. He took that step of faith exactly the way we can. There might be something that you think, again, God, I can't do that. God, I have no ability to do that. I have no skill. I have nothing. But God will supply. God, you want me to go put tracks on doors on Saturday mornings? Like, I don't want to get up. I like to sleep in. I like to sleep in too. But God will supply. God will give you the strength if you ask him for it. God will give you the strength to talk to the strangers out there at the doors or walking on the street. I talk to hundreds and hundreds of people. And sometimes it's hard because, like, I don't want to talk to this person. I want to look at the street and walk straight by them because they look weird, right? No. God will give strength to talk to that person. God will give strength to talk to that person about Jesus because, because we want to tell people that Jesus loves them as well. God will supply and provide in any way that God needs to, 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 do your, to do his will, to do his will. God will provide. And then we see that in this story where Abraham, he, he's going to sacrifice him, he's going to kill him. And then look, there's a ram caught in the thicket. And he calls the place God provides because God provided a sacrifice for Abraham. And in the same way, twofold, God provided a sacrifice for your sins. Jesus Becoming sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin, and he became that sacrifice. And because of that, he paid for our sins. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. He paid for those wages of sin. And then he rose again the third day, proving that he's God, guaranteeing our salvation, and all of that. So first of all, God provides our salvation. That's, that's one of the main points of this text to show that God will not call on us to provide our son, but he will give his son. He gave Jesus, his only begotten son, for us. So God will provide his son for salvation, but also God will provide for our needs. But, uh, but my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Not for what I want, but what I need to do his will. God will provide. God will provide so, in response to that, are you trusting him? Are you trusting in God's provision? Or are you just walking, walking along saying, I got this, or I'm going to be able to do this, or I don't care about any of this? Are you doing that? Are you trusting God's word? So, becoming a truster, we must trust in promises, trusting in God's direction, trusting in God's provision. We must trust God's word because it's the, it's the inerrant scriptures that God has given us, his word. And just like Abraham, and just like Abraham, when God told him, I'm gonna, I want you to sacrifice your son. I want you to sacrifice your son. And Abraham said, I'm going to do it because I trust you. And I know, I know, I know, I know that you're going to raise him from the dead because you promised in, in the chapter before that he's going to be the seed that it goes through. He promised. So we can trust the same. So are you a truster? Do you trust God in his word? Do you read the Bible and trust it? Do you take steps of faith showing your trust in his direction? And are you trusting in his provision to provide for all of those needs on those steps? Are you trusting in God? Because God wants to use you. God wants to use each and every single one of you. No matter if you're, uh, if you're young or you're older, whatever, God wants to use you. But in order to be used, we must trust. And we must have faith. So I, I, I plead with you and I, I push you. Let's, let's start trusting, becoming trusters. This sermon series that we've started off has been living by the book. We've talked about responding to God's word. Responding, just like um, when Peter... Uh, he responded to Jesus when Jesus uh, gave him all those fishes. He responded to God's word and he said, I'll drop those nets. He responded to God's word. And then the second thing we talked about was being doers. Um, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Not just hearing what I'm saying or what the Bible is saying, but also taking those steps and doing it. Becoming a doer. And finally, encapsulating all of those things, we must become trusters. 
we must become trusters because we trust in what God has said. Are you a truster? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? If you haven't, I encourage you to do that because God loves you. The second thing, if, you, if you're saved, are you trusting in God's direction and provision and His promises? Are you trusting in those things? And if you're not, I encourage you, today's a great day to start trusting in what God has said. Begin to become a truster. Step by step, day by day, trust in what God has said. Become trusters. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for uh, the blessing that it is to be here. I thank you for the blessing that it is um, to see you and to, to see you in your word and to, and to continue to get to know you, Father. I pray right now for these kids and these teens um, that, they, uh, that they trust your word and they become responders right now and respond to, to the Holy Spirit speaking to them, Father. And if there's any not saved in this room, I pray right now that you will save them, bring them to your knowledge, draw them to yourself, and, and give them the courage to make that decision today. Father, I thank you so much for all of these people. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Chris.